all of you. Uh, I'm really very, very humbled to uh, be here with you today. And uh, this is not just to get over with a few formalities, but uh, sincerely, um, I'm, I'm very, very humbled and uh, thank you every member of uh, Voyages into the Past, the Bangla Udi Prabhu, and members of uh, You Woman. Uh, it's beautiful that you open up a, a discussion, a series of discussion where, uh, you know, people from so many uh, fields actually can come and uh, join in, uh, share their comments, suggestions, and we also get a platform to reach out to a wider audience, uh, which is, uh, you know, across disciplines and very importantly across universities and colleges and even beyond that. There are students and also uh, people outside of colleges and universities and that's very, very beautiful. I, I congratulate uh, uh, everyone and, and those who, uh, of you who joined uh, for this. Um, before I, I begin, I'd like to share a couple of experiences um, uh, which is uh, not related to the people directly but it's not unrelated either, which is that um, Shagni had uh, shared a poster with me for, for, for this talk and it's, it's a good poster Shagni, wherever you are, it's, it's, it's a nice one um, but it had my photograph, the photograph of the speaker um, but I thought I'd share another poster with him to float uh, because anyway there's uh, is not too many available uh, of Lilani photographs that we come to see and um, I think Lilani also represents uh, a, a certain time so I thought maybe her photograph with a glimpse of a movement she was part of would uh, be more meaningful in the context of the talk. However, that uh, uh, that didn't help too much because uh, yesterday, I'm, I, I'm not on Facebook so I, didn't, I, I don't have too many spaces to share uh, these events. So I shared it on uh, what is called a WhatsApp story or a status, whatever it is called. So that's where um, I posted it and a lot of people actually uh, called me up and they inquired, like Shubhima said. And uh, it didn't come as a surprise to me and they asked me if it was the writer Lila Mojumbar. Uh, despite the photograph being there. Uh, and I didn't know what to tell them, you know. Um, I realized uh, what would I really say to 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 make them understand who Lila Mojumbar was. Shudhu Matru ki diplomi. Kebal Matru ki akkalin CPIM er member chilen ta par membership renew koren ni ta par CPIM er lero member chilen na. Abar actual ma na ki itihas jaman kore dekhte shachon do bol kore chile Lila ke as just Charu Mojumbar's uh, wife. I didn't know what to say because I think she's too enigmatic for history books to contain. Um, but something that struck me was uh, the fact that actually Lila B is not just herself. She's like many of her time. Actually, she represents a certain time that may be lost but not forgotten. So, um, and also, like, contribution as a political activist. contribution In fact, why I call her I haven't met her personally ever before. Uh, I haven't also been very directly associated with anybody um, uh, of her family. Uh, why do I still want to call her Lila is because I think the story is also uh, mine. The story is uh, of every household that we are very, very familiar with. Uh, it's a story that's not very unknown to us. You know, She's of a time, she, she talks about a certain kind of people, she talks about a certain kind of time, and that's exactly what my people will talk about. And also try and understand why has history been silent about reality. Uh, I'm not a scholar of history, but I've often wondered uh, the kind of 
um, you know, uh, things, his three comfortable writing and his complacent writing, um, as well as sociology, I mean, humanities and social sciences, they are, you know, certain disciplines that like to talk about certain stories in a certain way. Um, I'd like to one, I'd like to think uh, with you all together in terms of why it wasn't written. And also, let me um, begin this paper by telling you that it is not my intention today to bring out Leela B from her silence and give her voice or you know, bring her to life from invisibility. This is too audacious and this is an impossible task. And I don't think it is ethical either to be able to give someone voice who chooses to be silent. And uh, there's not uh, much uh, voice to give her uh, anyway because I think the silence that chimes is eternal. However, um, this one thing that I'd like to say that when we talk about it, when we discuss about it, probably we, we are able to embrace that silence, we are able to touch upon that invisibility and um, uh, just let, you know, just, just recall uh, the time she is part of. So I begin my paper, uh, it's a rather long paper, I, I apologize to you uh, from the very beginning. I'm, I'm not a very uh, good person to keep time, so if I go beyond my time, just let me stop there, okay? Because we can continue the discussion, you know, as it opens up to everybody in the, in the, in the house. Um, I've, I've titled the paper, Lila Mutunga, A Silence That Chimes, and this is a phrase that I borrow uh, from a cross poem called uh, Chimes of Silence by Paul Soenka, who was born in 1934. He was a Nigerian playwright a poet and a novelist, and he invokes this phrase uh, to describe his experiences uh, when he was in solitary confinement during the civil war of Nigeria. And he, he invokes this phrase to talk about the little glimpses he had from his people um, uh, where he actually couldn't see anything much. Uh, it's, it talks about his experience of solitary confinement. I'm sorry I'm not able to look that side too much, but um, I don't intend to uh, not. So it's, it's just a position I am in. So um, basically, uh, you know, I, I take this phrase because eventually uh, Soinka lands up seeing much more than he's able to see. You know, this um, experience of being able to see much more than we are allowed to see or seeing much more than is given for us to see is something that I really take inspiration from um, and I try to interpret this in the context of a silence uh, of Leela Mujumdar that is silent but not mute, you know, uh, it's, um, it's actually a silence that rings even after that silence was forgotten. So I begin. <coughs> And uh, of course, this paper is in English uh, because there are many uh, who are sure who speak Bangla. Because if I, I'll begin with the uh, certain lines in Bangla, but I, of course, have translated it. So here um, I start. I'm, I'm audible, right? Perfect. So let me just. Uttoriya jibone shorbon mo to mukutte pore jibone shorbon to mani jana chhane kaun chhoto the nirva nidosrote. Jahan mor oni mo chhaniyo. And this is how I've translated uh, for people who don't uh, talk in Bangla. In the journey when I meet the moment of my life greatest, may the words of atrocity come out of me with a flow undeterred, uninhibited. Whatever cannot be said, let it find a peace. Let it find a place, I'm sorry, in the heart of my dearest. And when the time shall be over, words that flow like a fountain will rest in the deep seas of silence. These are lines from the poem Shabola, written by Rabindranath Tagore in 1928. And these were the lines that gave Onita her first glimpse into Rabindranath by her mother, Leela Majumdar. History's silence on Leela Majumdar and Leela's silence on the history of Nakshambari movement intrigue me as an academic and woman. A silence that chimes, a silence that is not mute, but that which rings long after it is forgotten. This paper is about the life of Leela as a political activist, a mother, a wife, a comrade, who unrecognizably leaves behind the political tradition for many to continue, a tradition that possibly foregrounds a different, or should I say, an alternative vocabulary 
of the political movement. Lina's date of birth is not known to us. She was born in the year 1921 into a big joint family. She was the second of her five uh, siblings and the only daughter of her parents. She was initially named Ashalata and then Lila. Her mother was Bijan Mala Bibi. Her father, Orindranath Shengupta, was a doctor of the district board of Rangpur uh, in the unpartitioned Bengal and a member of the former bloc. Brought up amidst an ambience of medicine and politics, she saw people from diverse fields visit her um, house. She grew up too quickly and took up responsibilities of the family in the absence of her mother who left them when she was just 11. She completed her 10th grade examination but could not go to school any further. Later, she took her 12th grade examination in private and joined to teach at a primary school in the village. Meanwhile, Lila became a member of the Women's Self-Defense Committee, learned the basics of martial arts, and got initiated into secretly couriering political letters. She came in contact with the Communist Party and became one of its active members. After the death of her father, Lila and her family shifted to Jalpaiguri, where Lila joined to teach at Shishu Mohan School, but had to finally give up her job after the Communist Party was banned and she was taken to jail from where she had a hunger strike fighting for the rights of political prisoners. Leela Majumdar was fondly known as Leela Lee to those who worked with her and knew her personally. From Ashavata to Leela to Leela Shengupto to Leela Lee, her journey was manifold. Yet, she only remained known in the pages of history as the wife of Charu Majumdar, the revolutionary leader and the political and ideological architect of the late 60s National Party movement that originated as an armed peasant revolt in 1967 against brutal state repression in the village of Nakshalwari in West Bengal. <clears throat> Lina's life has not been written about or spoken about much. To write about her, I rely primarily upon a book edited by Moshri Bhumi, who is a writer, activist, performer, researcher and a friend to Lila's family. Her book, Lila Di and Onnora Jumiti Jabu, which is translated as Lila Di, another political practice published in 2018, is written in the memory of Lila. It is a reminiscence traced through family albums, photographs, and letters where Lila's family, friends, comrades, and colleagues write about her life and her times. Lila's political life was not strictly separated from a community of interrelations and an intimate life. In fact, much of her politics was rooted within the world, within the world of the personal. Thus, Moshri Bhumi edits the book with a vision of history that emerges from personal anecdotes and experiences of those who regularly write and also of those who never publicly wrote before, and from letters handwritten and ink smudged and at times torn. Many of these times are embedded and scattered with these multiple narratives and memories that are to a large extent personal. Hence, it does not come as a surprise that historians and academics generally have been silent about her. And those who write about her and her politics write rather personally. Maybe that is the very nature of Lila's politics and public life. For me, I have neither known Lila Mojunda personally nor have I been associated with the Nakshalwari movement. Apart from its cultural practices, expressed through music, theatre, cinema, and stories read and heard. Yet Lina is known to me and her silence is familiar, yet intriguing. Also, I write, as I write, I struggle to label Lina and her stories as either the story of a national leader's wife and comrade or just a left party worker, a woman who can be called a feminist or an everyday mother or comrades Lila Di or Lila Mujunda or Lila Shingupta or just Lila. The story is intertwined discourses and confused categories and classifications. I only hear her silent speak through the pages that talk about a mother, a colleague, a comrade, whose stories are ours too, and whose silence is familiar yet enigmatic. I keep wondering how to write about the familiar and enigmatic as I keep writing this paper and possibly in the process methodologically carve out a way of writing that is neither personal nor political, but maybe both. As I read about Lila, I contemplate about stories of many more lives that evoke poignants that resist categorizations. And as I write about Lila, I am pushed out of the comfort zone of writing either academically or intimately. Lila's life opens 
a newer path of the political and a newer path of writing about the political. I don't intend to interrupt an intimate space of writing, nor do I have the audacity to bring anyone to light from an invisibility within the pages of history. I rather humbly wish to touch upon the invisible and the intimate life and, and, and the intimate that are specific to Lila Mojundar, but not hers only. This paper is not about rewriting stories that are already written or merely translating selected portions from one language to another. It is about critically reflecting upon these stories and asking a few questions that move beyond only the life of Lila Mojundar and the National Party Movement. The questions raised in this paper are not new, but methodologically significant in terms of where and how one locates them. Can anyone switch off the fan just as above me? Uh, I'm just worried the papers won't uh, fly away. I seek through this paper to foreground an alternative vocabulary of the political within a movement that is both personal and public, emotional and affective. Taking from the life force of leaders every day, the paper asks what it means to be political and what it means to be political from the eye of a woman. These concerns in turn seek to address critically how to write about a personal movement within a political movement and how to write about a personal political path carved out by a woman that is unmediated by either the state or her male comrades. This paper seeks to bring forth stories that challenge dominant modes of knowing and writing. Activists' recollections of sexual and gender-based violences within political movements critically reflect about society's ways of warning about some, silencing some more, and eventually forgetting them. Uh, a recent wave of scholarship uh, provides a very necessary gender-based critique of the left revolutionary movement. Uh, and militant politics in general. Um, some of uh, these literatures uh, that are emerging are uh, by Mallarika Sinha Roy, Srila Roy, um, Ojita, uh, Omarada Gandhi, and Krishna Bhagavata. It brings to focus the naturalization and the everydayness of such violence that is otherwise made ordinary in the face of extraordinary politics. This focus on the gender nature of Nakshalbari and revolutionary movements in general that is otherwise absent in a considerable historiography of Nakshalbari undoubtedly provides a critical intervention into the taken for granted meaningless of such movements. It brings us stories of life histories of women in the margin who now become an integral part of the collective memory of the movement. However, it is still important to ask how we combat the meaningless of movements in general also. Does the answer necessarily lie in making the visible the invisible? Does it lie uh, in making visible the invisible by, by giving voice to those voices unheard of? What it means to be political in the context must be reimagined. <coughs> What does it mean to have agency? How must one understand questions of representation, empowerment, and visibility in writing history and addressing the political? What happens if one begins to shift the paradigm of the political? If that which constitutes the political is a certain idea of maleness and its visibility in the public, it appears to me particularly a little naive and unoriginal to keep being engaged in a catching up discourse of identity formation that attests to a similar paradigm of power and recognition. Emerging literatures that address the gender question do so along similar lines of power and phallocentric culture that characterize much of the movement and its male centric historiography. There, politics is still separate from the personal, and the intimate is not a feature of the writings of history. Thus, what we must begin to ask is, why must we write in the way we write? And why must we think the way we think? How many names must be written of women before she can catch up to her male comrade? How much visibility must one claim before she can be known to exist? How many times must she be represented before we know of her presence? The answer may lie in reimagining silence as inwardly powerful and outwardly enigmatic. The answer may lie, I read again, 
in reimagining silence as inwardly powerful and outwardly enigmatic, inaccessible to appropriation by either the state or the academic, the comrade or the traitor, the market or the media. Too much is often written and too little known, too much in circulation and too little retained. Lina Mojumdar's life makes me reflect on the often taken for granted correlation between visibility and power, power and voice. It is time we think how we could place women's political agency beyond the stereotypes of female heroism that are often invoked in nationalist and leftist historiography. We come to know of an incident from Orjit Mojumdar's interview and writings about his mother, Lila's encounter with the police when we came to raid, and raiding really was a routine affair in their house. On most occasions, the raiding would be in the night. There was no electricity, only a kerosene lantern. Charu, Lila, and their three children, Onita, Modunita, and Odijit, shared the same bed to sleep in the night. There was only one bed in the big house. When there was a knock at the door, they invariably knew the police had come to take their father away. It would always be Lila who opened the door and asked if they had a warrant. She would keep them waiting outside if they didn't have one and until they finished the procedures that Lila followed as a precautionary measure against the possibility of any false accusations of keeping arms at home. She would make a list of all the weapons the police carried with them, such as the number of revolvers and the number of bullets. She would sign on that list and have it countersigned by, by the inspector so that they couldn't falsely accuse them. It was a significant stra strategy she devised to stop the false accusations of a sudden discovery of arms and weapons in many homes at that time. Lina was not involved in armed actions and possibly her position as a middle class woman did not necessitate or allow her to plunge into the supreme revolutionary act of martyrdom that was, as literature tells us, only a male privilege. Also, Lila's life did not reflect the strong cult of martyrdom of her dead husband, whereby the martyrdom of a male partner bestowed a sanctified position on the martyr's widow. Charu Majumdar died in police custody in 1972 after he was caught underground in Calcutta. By that time, his health had been deteriorating and he was possibly denied his basic medications while in police custody, and the soles of his feet had turned dark and black a memory that left a scar in the minds of his loved ones. Even after 45 years of his father's death, 57-year-old Obhijit Mojumdar narrates this last image of his father as he talks to the wire in 2014. A dangerous enemy of the establishment, even the dead body of Charu Mojumdar was unsafe for the police to keep unburned for too long. For once in her life, Lila visibly came out of her composure sat down speechless and shocked to the news of her husband's death. Although she knew he was in custody, maybe she still had faith he would come back. The police denied her request to take her husband's body back to his hometown. At the end of that unforgettable day when the family came back from the crematorium at Karatola, Lila asked her and the daughter, Onita, is it all over? It's all over, isn't it? The confirmed and interrogative state of mind at once evoke a sense of final defeat on one hand and stoic, lingering hope on the other. We come to know from various narratives within the book on Lila that Charu never looked into the material necessities of maintaining a home. On top, he gave away the pieces of land they had to choose, uh, they had to those who needed them. The family was in deep financial crisis already, yet in Lila's heart there was plentitude. It was no wonder how Lila was ready to forego rents of those two families who were tenants in her house and how the family was sheltering extended relatives who stayed with them whilst Lila was, only earning, was the only earning member of the household who worked hard day and night as Life Insurance Corporation of India, LIC agent. The eldest daughter, Anita, was studying medicine. Monumita came back after her father's death to Dalpaiguri and lost her ability to move. The youngest son was six years old. Lila single-handedly attended to the family's needs, but as minimally as possible because this care was not meant only for those who were her own children or those who belonged only to the family or the movement. 
It embraced relations from her party she worked before, but never moved past in her mind or heart. It embraced those comrades who came hungry and without whose burden she would let go of her meaning to feed them, for there was not enough left in the house to cook again. This embraced all the staff and teachers and Ayamashis who worked in the school she had founded and looked after those children who were all her own. After the news of Charu Mojumdar's death, neighbors and relatives helped them financially for needs that were immediate. Although neighbors and relatives did not disassociate with Leela's family, for they loved Leela and Charu and the family was known for their goodwill and compassion, her son writes that the struggle was all Leela's. He narrates the time after his father's death. Those comrades who were out of the jail and wished to help the family couldn't reach them because of the fear of police arrest. The state and media sought to project Charu Mojumdar as CIA agent, as a man-eater, as the villain, and many more. Not just the media or the state, many actually the first-time leadership within the party itself, CPIML, began to blame Charu Mojumdar's line of action as a sole cause for the failure of the movement. Lila lived with betrayal and accusations and misgivings. She lived to see comrades like Kamushanna, who was a brother-like figure to her, stop visiting them. To her, the political and the personal could not remain separate experiences so that the suffering within one could keep the other untouched. She was overwhelmed with too much grief and she came across even more stoicism from the outside. The short history of the Nakshalbari movement um, speaks of a longer history of broken and betrayed relationships and Lila, among many others, outlived its short history with brokenness and betrayal. The mudslinging, the accusations, the misgivings one lived to experience needed a different kind of force to carry on with life. And this moving on was not by moving places or leaving country and trying to leave back all that is intertwined with the memory of the moment. This moving on meant staying back amidst the material and the cultural memories as the next generation grew up. Those whose politics was a continuum in life without a separation between the personal and the political went through a strong sense of betrayal of interpersonal relations that formed much of their community, neighborhood, family and party. The separation of party lines often mapped on to the separation of personal relations with a weakening of kinship and comradeship. Yet, Lila's sister-in-law, who Lila loved and cared for like her own daughter, narrates about Lila's will to live with others and for others. Despite a series of splits, partitions, deaths and mishaps, she bore all her life. Happiness was momentary in Lila's life. Grief would come down like a night and take it all away. Pain seemed to be one with her, yet she never lived only for herself. She lived with everyone and labored and struggled and worked all her life. Her silence, however, to the media, to interviewers, to neighbors, kid or kin or anyone even within the immediate family about either her husband's death or about the movement or the party was a firm and resilient was as firm and resilient as her encounter with the police during those raids at night when she would, uh, when they would come looking for her comrade. The silence was not stillness, however. She labored and struggled to make ends meet till she met with a road accident and took to bed from where she took to work she began her life with, which is to teach children. Lina's lifelong care for and continuous labor to the idea of a left beyond only the party that required sacrifice for a foregoing of material pleasures and personal comforts and unfailingly being by those in need remain trapped within a curious gender narrative. Men who represented this left lineage became heroes of the history of left politics and women who came to embody this left virtue remained with the label of passive wives of those men in the eyes of both men and women, historians and feminists alike. This culture and politics of gendering values and ethics and virtues within the history of left movement doubly jeopardized women such as Lila who embodied the feminine pathos in silence. She neither fit into what academic and activist Nondini Thor calls the Madhavila the complex, uh, taken from Shamraj Majumdar's Kalbala, among those women who only wish to remain faithful lovers and wives of their male comrades. Nor could she become the national feminist that Thor claims herself to be and uh, expects Nashal 
women leaders to become those who write their own story and claim their own rights. Leela's silence is testimony to history's politics of silencing some struggles over another, the politics of remembering some stories and forgetting others. Referring to her mother-in-law as Leela Dee, historian Piti Bhattacharya writes that history has remained complacent with Leela as just Charu Mojumdar's wife. Leela's personal contribution to the history of left politics has been erased. Bhattacharya thinks that Leela's unwillingness to challenge this rather narrow and unjust label that history has bestowed upon her could be a possible reason for her lifelong silence on the Nakshalbar. Leela was neither an armed revolutionary nor did she become a sanctified widow. Leela's political prudence and clairvoyance rather turned upside down the Nakshal slogan of power comes through the barrel of the gun at every encounter with the police who was made to disarm before they entered her house. She silently carved the path of her own at Unno Rajmiti Jagod that never featured as a fan feminist narrative. Now what really features as a feminist perspective then? What does it mean to be political from a woman's eye? Krishna Vandapartha, an eminent figure of the Nakshalbari movement, wrote an essay titled Nakshalbari Politics, a Feminist Narrative. And the article drew much attention from feminists. It was first published in Bangla in 2001 as part of the series Jutro Onari in Quote Akhun, a feminist magazine edited by Krishna Vandapartha himself. Citing examples and situations and events that beheld the gender unequal nature of the movement, she claimed that the history of the movement would have been different had the feminist question of equality been dealt with more objectively. On the other hand, that as women, they felt they were not treated by the enemy as enemy enough. Their actions, which were in no way devoid of risk, were still not covered by the media. Women, unlike the men, had no clear party directives of the roles they must play. And there were no major roles to play. They were merely asked to offer shelter to revolutionaries, make tea, carry letters and documents, and nurse the wounded. As women, they felt insignificant. As a woman, the struggle seemed manifold. Yet one is left to wonder about the possibility and the transformative capacity of the value of an equal society. A classless equal society was a dream of every notion. Yet, roles and tasks continue to be hierarchical and perceived to be bigger or smaller, unfortunately. The feminized tasks remain insignificant in the eye of the feminist and the men continue to uphold this binary imagining that impinges upon how we in turn learn to look at ourselves as women. If cooking and nursing remain feminized and insignificant in the eyes of the male national leaders, the women took thought of these as insignificant. The dream to be a leader, to be in action and to claim half the sky, bear testimony of continuous gender struggles, but it remains in the end, I believe, a bargain with the patriarchal order to grant the woman a little space within it, not to open up an alternative political vision that is one's own, granted neither by the police nor the male comrade. Mandapatha states that only after a point when her name along with many other women's names got to the police at the time of unrest and rising atrocities did she begin to feel important and relieved. The enemy had, she writes, I quote, the enemy had honored us with the status of being their enemy. I won't deny that being thus identified as an enemy brought a sense of relief rather than produce a sense of fear. Women could have enemies after all, she said. As a woman, she fought not one but two struggles, one of class and the other of gender. She writes, I shall dream of a liberated society where someday women will claim half the sky. Yet, when gender war was at its sharpest, Moshe Mohamed writes that Lila De makes her look into the sharp divisions of gender war through a lens that is much more complex, contradictory, and perspectival, invoking a simultaneous condition of strength and vulnerability. Srila Roy addresses a related question in terms of some of the ethical quandaries that lie at the root of how one could reflect on the issues of gender, power, and violence as far as women's political mobilization in contemporary South Asia is concerned. Two important questions in the context are about women's place in men's war. Should feminists argue for women's equal rights to take up arms against repression and injustice? 
Or should they champion the democratization and demilitarization of such struggles? Should they celebrate the unexpectedly large numbers of women that have joined the ranks of South Asian insurgencies as a measure of their agency? Or should they challenge the militarization of women's identities therein? Feminist ethical concerns such as these must begin to reimagine agency. What means to have an independent voice? Any voice is the only register of revolution. Unless we are able to appreciate the complex relation between gender, power, and ethics, how must we make meaning of leader's agency in terms of her role as the wife and comrade of an annihilator, a militant and revolutionary who believed in an armed overthrow state power and her lifelong on the other hand, draw in a life insurance agency where she worked till she was physically able in order to financially support her children and those of the children of her household mate and other relatives and comrades. How do we make meaning of her life that navigates through annihilation, nihilism on one hand and life preservation and insurance on the other? How do we make sense of Leela's continuous underground years old and strategies to meet her underground comrade with the risk of taking her little son and sometimes her daughters so that they could meet their father? In failing to binarize reality from stories such as these, one is pushed towards problematizing the necessary associations between agency and empowerment on one hand and the perceived conflict between ensuring life and annihilating life between comradeship and independence, between confirmation and resistance on the other. Mushroom Bhavik writes about how the care and labor of nurturing and nourishing a garden become one with the spirit of revolution. She brings back the reference of Alice Walker's revolutionary petunias uh, in 1973, time and again as she writes about Lila Dien about a path that carves out another political practice. The hope and unfinished revolution speaks through the lines of Walker. Don't you forget to water my purple petunias. Don't you forget to water my purple petunias. These lines make Moshuri reflect on how Walker saw her, saw in her mother a revolutionary artist as she gardened after a long day of hard work. The lines also echo Obijit's reminiscing of his mother's gardening that made him see Lila as someone close to the land and soil. A proximity to Mother Earth possibly connects Hereby, mothers distant in time and space, culture and language. Obijit and Alice Walker and many more like us in Walker's words are all possibly, quote unquote, in search of our mother's gardens. Literature's writing on the silencing of, of gender and sexual violence and inequality movements bring out many stories through oral narratives <coughs> and life histories that have been absent for too long in national life historiography. And what is possibly lost forever are those lives that are neither remote, out of media coverage, or of not of, uh, of a not so remote 20 years of long silence of a comrade, wife, mother, activist, who never wrote her own story, and whose story no one else wrote, apart from those who personally knew and loved her, yet her silence was not turning away from life because her life was not hers only. Like the purple petunias of another mother of another time, the beetle nut trees, the coconut trees, the magnolia, the lemon tree and forget-me-not were all extensions of Leela in the garden of her boundless home. Whatever may be claimed of Leela Mojumar's life, she kept us grappling with how to fit her into either the home or the outside as she embraced and navigated both to dissolve and blur their separations. Titi Bhattacharya reminisces of the house she and Leela were both part of. She says, Leela De is sitting in an old wooden house whose front gate remained open always. The visual gives us a glimpse not just of the architecture of her house, but also a landscape of her time and life, where the private public world naturally blurred into one another. Leela was not Leela alone. She embodied a time, yet she outlived the pages of history and the historical into the eternal. Lila's quiet yet firmly grounded res resistive politics against the hegemony of the left, uh, radical left, 
comes out through various stories from Leela's life that to my eyes leave a legacy amongst many contemporary Naksha like-minded party workers and leaders, a legacy that hitherto remains unrecognized. Lila remains a political person whose idea of the political could not be confined to 
one single political party of either the CPIM or the CPIM, or for that matter, any party. Kondani Dashgupta was an eminent leader of the Communist Party in Yonbaiguri and the wife of Shuchin Dashgupta, under whose guidance Charu Mutunda began his political journey. When the party was banned in 1948, she, along with Leela and many others, were taken to jail. Leela went to the jail again in the year 1950, and she was the only woman prisoner. Later, she was moved to the Calcutta jail, where she met other uh, eminent communist leaders like Gita Mukherjee, Ranu Mukherjee, and Monikum Tulashin. A few days um, before uh, she passed away, Comrade uh, Kulmani, who was also Leela's colleague at school, reminisces about Leela. She says Leela was not an ordinary woman. For a woman to keep intact her uncompromising protesting self in the socio-economic circumstances we are embedded is, uh, is, is a continuous everyday shangra, uh, a continuous everyday struggle and that is of utmost necessity. The struggle requires a strong ideology and at its, uh, at its root, and Milani was unambiguously clear about this. We also come to know about how difficult it was during the mid-40s to work as, as, as part of the Communist Party. Leela's firmness was her only weapon. It was not an easy task for Leela and her comrades within the Communist Party to, to reach the women who were, for uh, various reasons, skeptical and apprehensive about politics. Yet they reached them despite all sorts of constraints, and they were and there was barely any money uh, for work, uh, which is usually the case uh, for for any kind of political activism, always, even today. And they worked miles to look after the infrastructural backbone of their party work. And they ran the, uh, the milk canteen, the little handicrafts, collected and distributed arms, appointed party members, went to reading groups, informed at every doorstep about upcoming public meetings and rallies, and continued working for the women's self-defense organization, Atharukha Shamiti. Uh, then there were household chores and a job to take care of. Alongside the time she made Tamanbuti um, uh, you know, Bani to make chapatis for comrades was, uh, was almost like a ritual for those working in such contexts. In 1948, when the Communist Party was declared banned and almost all com uh, comrades taken to jail, Leela marched through the sl sloganeer, Ye Azadi, Judha, this freedom is, is, is a lie. Continuing to reminisce about her, Kulani contemplates that the pages of the history of nationalist struggles never write about these women. I know. Yet, I believe that from the works of these unsung people, nationalist movements gain their strength and character. Thus, Vidadi, even by her absence, shall remain present and living in the hearts of many young people in several debates and discussions, memories and struggles with a deep honor. Why is history silent about Lila? Her life was possibly too enigmatic on one hand and too mundane, ordinary and everyday on the other. She did not fit a binary and maybe it was convenient to label her as just a regular supportive wife and caring mother of a regular middle class household. She possibly embodied the stereotypical feminine image of a woman whose party activities declined much after her marriage to a person who was increasingly becoming the popular male political hero of an armed revolution. Lena's story may be just another story of an oppressed woman victim who never realized she was oppressed or whose life was complicit in the patriarchal structure of politics. However, could it be our incapacity to grapple with the inter intertwined personal political everyday that could not be comprehended through binary imaginings? Could it also be our incapacity to locate the extraordinary within the ordinary? We take for granted and are often unable to see or value that which is near and close to home, Moshe Nipomi writes. Titi Bhattacharya is writing about Lidadi brings that out very poignantly. She writes, to me, Lidadi is not just a communist woman who had to go to jail several times for an uncompromising belief in her political ideologies. On a stormy night when, with heavy rains, she sat with me all along as I sat for her son to return home. She was aging. Lidadi, to me, is also this woman.
I mean, the internal party splits that followed Charun Mujumdar's death in 1972, Lila started to withdraw in words. Even during informal conversations, Obiji Mujumdar writes that their mother refrained from engaging in deep political discussions. He wondered why. Could it be increasing familial and financial burdens? Could it be a silence to safeguard comrades against the police? Could it be a deep sense of betrayal from comrades within the party? There was no simple answer to the silence, he says. And I wonder, must all silences have answers? Must all silences be classified and categorized to fit into something? Must it necessarily address a gender question or a class question for it to become theorizable to us academic? The enigma of Leela Majumdar, the 20 long years of silence after her husband's death, her invisibility and revolutionary ethos of remaining silent about the whereabouts of uh, a comrade to the state or the media came to signify one another. Leela, just like the movement itself, remained underground, inaccessible and invisible, unable for either the media or the state to appropriate her life or the lives of those she wished to keep private and secure. Titi Bhattacharya writes, sometimes when Leela Lee was not watching me, I used to secretly keep looking at her, and her silence unfailingly narrated the story to me, the picture of an effervescent, effervescently turbulent past bottled up and frozen within her, entangled and intertwined, waiting to explode at any moment that can immediately change the time forever. If the young generation, she writes, if the young generation remembers their past and takes ahead what Lilavi has left back as teachings to shape their future, that would be the world peace tribute to Lila Mojumdar. Yet in the end, who Lila really is remains an enigma and a challenge to any discipline or discourse that wish to label and erase her or make visible and name her. At times, Lila subverted the obvious and the normative in ways that raise the question who Lila really was. Was she the affectionate sister next door or the LIC agent whose ultimate concern centered around women's interests and well-being? Or she was one who was remembered by the village women as that dedicated communist party worker several years later. Or maybe she was that experienced, burnt out political worker who, after her husband's death, despite being witness to so much, and possibly because she was witness to so much, maintained an enigmatic, enigmatic silence all her life. Oh Lord, why would you not give a woman the right to overcome her fate? Why should I be left to the margins, head bowed, fatigued and struggling to see the fulfillment of my wishes? Must I stare at an emptiness and not seek for myself my own way? I won't go to the wedding bed adorned as the wife I would rather emerge fearless from the seeds of love. I will leave back my false troubles, knowing that my humility was not worthy enough for those incapacitated to honor it. I will let go hereafter my coy that fails me. I will meet you by the shore of a raging sea, and the uproaring tumult as waves will hurl at the hearts of horizon, the clarion of victory. I will undo the veil of a woman and say, you are the only one who's mine, whether in this world or beyond it. O oh Lord, don't keep me speechless, from my blood oozes the valor of the Bina. In the journey, when I meet the moment of my life greatest, let the words of virtuosity come out of me with a flow untethered, uninhibited. Whatever cannot be said, let it find a place in the heart of my dearest, and when the time shall be over, Words that flow like a mountain would rest in the deep seas of silence. These were the lines that gave Anita her first glimpse into Rubina Thakur by her mother Lila. These are the lines that give us a glimpse into the life of Lila. Life, lines that embrace her silence and make them one with the eternal. The waves of the deep sea soaring into the wind that blows carries the silence. A silence that jumps. Thank you very much.